And, well, I'm really thrilled to be here. And it's, it's absolutely thrilling and a little nerve wracking to know that people who are in the book are in the audience here. <laughs> Ad Adrian as well is, is in here. Um, and uh, so the book is actually not officially published until this uh, Friday, the 15th. But uh, so this is, I did an event last night. This is my second event, so it's very exciting. Um, so I, I have, uh, this story is part memoir. It's a lot about birds and there's also a lot of history. And since I'm here in the Hudson Valley and I hike a lot in the Catskills, one of my uh, go-to um, history people is John Burroughs, who was uh, an incredibly well-known and well-read nature writer in the 19th century. He was born in 1837 in the Catskills. And there's some of these quotes here that you might recognize. Um, if I were to name the three most precious resources in life, I should say books, friends, and nature. And the greatest of these, at least the most constant and always at hand is nature. And this uh, wonderful quote, love is the measure of life, only so far as we love do we really live. And you must have the bird in your heart before you can find it in the bush. So a word of advice about bird finding there. But it's, and when I, once I started birding, I started paying more and more attention to how Burroughs wrote about birds. He has this wonderful essay about his ascent of Slide Mountain, which takes him three days. For those of you who've gone up Slide to look for Big Nails Thrush, it probably takes you about an hour and a half to two hours to get to the summit at this point. It's a very different experience. Um, but his, his account is wonderful. And then he, he goes to, he, he finds the bird, which he refers to as the Slide Mountain Thrush because he thinks that where it nests is really only on top of Slide Mountain. Of course he's wrong, but um, at the time that's where they were finding it. And this is how he describes the song, which I, his descriptions of writing about bird song to me are just uh, incredible. The song is in a minor key, finer, more attenuated and more under the breath than that of any other thrush. It seemed as if the bird was blowing in a delicate, slender golden tube, so fine and yet so flute-like and resonant the song appeared. At times it was like a musical whisper of great sweetness and power. But this is where Burroughs really got me. Uh, as the years go by, we are all of us more or less subject to two dangers, the danger of petrifaction and the danger of putrefaction. Said so another way, you can either rot or you can turn to stone or you can take up birding. That's my response. Um, so I started birding when I was, uh, 49 years old. And we all know that that's a really stupid time to take up something as complicated as birding because it requires good eyesight, good hearing and good memory. And all of those are going downhill at that point. Um, I came to my birding after a lifetime spent outside rock climbing, as Anne mentioned, kayaking, uh, backpacking all over the world, uh, hitchhiked my way around the world as well. And though I paid attention to the birds when I was doing these things, I wasn't focused on them. Although when an Adelie penguin walks up to you, you actually do kind of pay attention. Um, and I, I wasn't paying attention for two reasons. One is I, I, I really didn't have the patience for it. Um, and I also had this uh, profound fear that once I started paying attention to birds, that it would take over my life. And I wasn't wrong. Um, so once... The Viri sang its spiral of white gold outside of my house. That was it. I was hooked. Um, so all of you listening have your spark bird. This is, this is mine. And I'm going to read to you from a, a short passage from the beginning of the book about a, a spark experience. One of my favorite conversion stories is told by Frank Chapman, longtime curator of birds at the Museum of Natural Histor History, editor of Bird Lore, and founder of the Christmas Bird Count, now one of the great annual birding traditions. He wrote in his autobiography about the moment he decided to focus his life on the birds. It was the end of the 19th century when Chapman found himself working in a bank in order to make a proper living. He met a man, also a banker, and what he saw he did not want to be or become. Quote, as I looked at him, there suddenly sprang into my mind with the force of a revelation 
a determination to devote my life to the study of birds. The sudden and convincing manner in which it was formed had in it something mystical, which seemed to take the matter wholly out of my hands. Chapman was surely aware that he was writing about his commitment to the birds as if it were a religious experience. His decision is faded, driven by an outside force, God or the birds themselves. Sudden soul-moving life choices, no one did it more dramatically than St. Augustine, who chronicled his path in the Confessions. And even though his conversion occurred in 386 AD, it remains, despite the fact we do not live in an age of miracles, a good model. Augustine's conversion did not come about, with, come about without years of hesitations, of wanting his salvation, but not being able to give over. Give me chastity, but not yet, he cries in what is perhaps my favorite line in the book. Chapman too spent years birding before he gave over, left the bank and became a central figure in the history of American bird life. I too spent years wanting to know the birds, always curious about a raptor spied spinning in the sky or the songs that accompanied me when I hiked in the Catskills. But as the years marched on, I kept hesitating. Give me birds, but not yet. So then I, I do give over with that, with that Viri. And um, as I said, you know, I was 49 years old and I was uh, uh, kind of nervous about trying to, to learn all of this or, or some of it or part of it. Or, um, and because I threw myself in completely, I was doing an enormous amount of reading at the same time. And when I came across Olive Thorne Miller, um, who also started birding when she was 49, I took a lot of solace. And not only did she start birding at age 49, she managed to write 11 books about it, including Birdways and With the Birds in Maine. I'm only gonna write one book, um, <laughs> this, this, this is it. Um, and along with Florence Marion Bailey, who I also read a, a lot of her work, uh, they were the first two women members of the AOU. And so knowing that I had these sort of, you know, grandmothers out there uh, uh, helped me a lot. And once I started reading about um, uh, the bird world and, and encountering figures like this, I was simply thrilled that uh, it wasn't just the birds. I realized that I had entered a world when I started birding, that it, you know, we have our own heroes and heroines, we have our own language, uh, we have our own ethics, we have our own history. And so I just immersed myself in all of this. So there are a few threads in this book. There are the birds, of course, um, that, uh, that, that guided me. I had a lot of uh, dumb luck in my first year of birding, finding a long-eared owl, for instance, uh, on New Year's Eve. I thought that I should find a great bird every year on New Year's Eve. It's never happened since. Um, and I was, I was guided in a lot of this by uh, somebody who probably many of you know, Peter Schoenberger, who's a wonderful birder and a, and a wonderful photographer as well. And, and uh, he is a, a sparrow man to the, to the core. And so while I was really wanting big birds that were colorful to sit up and sing for me, he was having a scouring the countryside for sparrows. Um, so as I, as I threw myself into this world, I, I tried to figure out, this is where I first met Gail and Tom was at the Forktail Flycatcher. <laughs> um, uh, trying to figure out what kind of birding I enjoy. Did I like uh, twitching? Um, did I like driving uh, and flying across the country to find birds? Um, went to Alaska, visited Gamble and Nome. Um, and so as I'm, as I'm having this marvelous time traveling around, I'm continuing to read and it's not just uh, reading about the bird people, reading about Roger Tory Peterson, beginning with Alexander Wilson and uh, John James Audubon, obviously one of my favorites is uh, Edwin Forbush who wrote his Birds of Massachusetts and other uh, New England states. Um, but finding characters like Nathan Leopold who probably many of you know from the, uh, what was called the crime of the century along with his pal uh, Loeb that they committed a murder that they thought they could get away with as committing the perfect crime. Um, he was uh, an amazing birder. He had a collection of um, a few thousand skins uh, at the time that he was 18 and was convicted of this murder. 
and but the bird that he focused on most was the Kirtland's warbler. Uh, and he took he took these trips to northern Michigan, uh, found the third known nest of the of the Kirtland's warbler, and uh, wrote about it in in the auk. And uh, this is one of those images that I spent a lot of time looking at. Um, this this man uh, who is capable of killing another human being is here feeding a fly to a baby Kirtland's warbler. So that, that uh, exquisite combination of uh, great tenderness and extreme brutality um, kind of fascinated me um, and continued to fascinate me about the, the birding world. Um, and a, another uh, more local uh, historical moment that uh, has intrigued me and, and has started uh, my own tradition of going out on May 10th to listen to the Dong Chorus at Thompson Pond, which is what uh, FDR did on May 10th, 1942. Uh, he's here flanked by Daisy Sukley, who was his distant cousin, the one who gave him his dog, Fala. And she's the one who organized this, this trip. Um, and then next to her is Ludlow Griscom, who's often referred to as the Dean of American bird watching, and then Alan Frost, uh, a very expert birder in Dutchess County, and James Whitehead, who actually wrote an article about this, uh, this, this incredible outing that they did where they saw 23 species of warblers. Um, and I think after, you know, I, I haven't been birding nearly as long as probably all of you in the audience, um, but what, I, what I've come to realize is that I really love being close to home. Um, my, the Tivoli Bays is what is close to my house, uh, looking out over the North Bay to the Caxtill Mountains, going out Kruger Island Causeway in any kind of weather is always a treat. Today I found a Virginia rail and I often encounter my favorite bird, which is the rusty blackbird. I'm gonna read from my first Christmas bird count. Chapman announced the first Christmas census in bird lore, the journal that he founded and edited and, and that later became Audubon Magazine. It would have been easy to miss his call to count as it, as it is wedged between a photo captioned, guess this bird and a cheerful poem titled, the Reverend Mr. Chickadee D whose sermon consists of the advice to be happy, be diligent, and brave. This original bird census had few rules, just the mission to go out and see birds, then send the results into the journal as soon as possible. Laced into these few guidelines is a sense of wholesome competition of who might find the most birds or the most unexpected birds. For Chapman's first count, 27 people combed 25 random locations. It was a warm Christmas day in the Northeast and no one saw either red or white winged crossbills. Clarence Brook from Keene, New Hampshire counted for three hours noting one Northern Shrike, one crow and 16 black capped chickadees. Many started searching for birds around eight or nine in the morning with only one person out there at 6.30 in the morning in Oberlin, Ohio, who in three and a half hours found 14 species. All of this sounds quaint and the numbers tiny compared to what unfolds today with the Audubon organization overseeing more than 2000 counts in the Western hemisphere. That means thousands of people coming swamps, forests, fields and shorelines for birds. What remains connecting the early 20th century to the 21st century is that sense of competition. Now, not just wholesome, but vigorous. I doubted Chapman had any sense how big his idea would become. Yet how marvelous that this man who had such a near religious conversion to the birds launched this holiday that for many birders is the most sacred day of the year. Through the whole, though the whole thing sounded tedious, a long day mostly spent in the car, not birding, but counting birds, I anticipated my first CBC as if it might be my induction into the holy world of birding. I prepared in the only way I knew how for a celebration, I cooked. When I slipped into the car at four in the morning of December 18th, I packed turkey soup and onion quiche, ham and cheese sandwiches, blue corn chips, carrot sticks, homemade biscotti, and a thermos of tea. Whatever else might happen, we would not be hungry. We drove west on 209, the town of Stone Ridge still asleep as we sped through toward our sector. Once we pulled into our territory, Peter stopped so that I could note time and mileage of our nighttime hours. And then we were off, Peter slaloming the winding roads of our sector, the headlights of the car slicing a narrow path through the darkness and trees. 
A disorientation settled in as Peter turned left then right while I marveled over the size of our sector. After 20 minutes, we jounced down a dirt packed road then crossed a small creek before Peter pulled over next to a wooded hillside. We slid out of the warm car into 15 degrees of cold. A frozen silence enveloped the woods as the engine ticked from warm to cold. I stared, open mouthed toward the heavens, a canopy of stars lighting the swampy area in front of us and the dense woods that formed a wall of darkness. I tried to see into the darkness, the open space that was the road leading into denser woods, the clearing in front of us that framed the, the clearing in front of us framed black by the night. I shivered, not at the cold, but at the beautiful and overwhelming limitlessness of the world. And somewhere out there might be a sawwit owl. With my first icy breaths, I felt that to be absurd. Nothing was out there, the whole earth frozen. In the weeks before the count, Peter had scouted this sector, which had been his to count for the past four years. He drove around to get a sense of what birds were where, which houses might have a feeder up luring in birds, and what habitats he might have missed in past years. During that reconnoiter, he had realized that this remote section, dense with conifers, was perfect territory for solid owls. All owls are special, seen as powerful, mysterious, and wise, but the solid is so tiny, only three ounces of bird, it's all of those things as well as adorable. With a proportionally big head and luminous eyes, it has a cat-like aspect. The sawwet is more silent in the night than, it, than its much bigger bard and great horned cousins. So finding one by luck or chance as it lets out his song is unlikely. Peter had never heard or seen any sawwets on CBC before. That doesn't mean that they aren't here, he said. People don't see sawwets because they don't look for them. Peter paused to be sure I was following his logic while I mused over whether this was true for all of the best things in life. To find the good bird, you have to look for the good bird. You have to believe in them, he said, as if asking me to believe in God. God appearing on this road seemed more likely than a sawit, though both asked for me to imagine, believe, hope. But the bird also asked me to be logical, think about habitat and what is possible, stretch for what, what might be out there. That lesson came at me again and again. I shuffled waiting for Peter to play the owl's song through his iPod. The canopy of stars lit the sky, yet I did not feel the warmth of their light as the darkness around me squeezed in tight, leaving me lightheaded. After a long pause, Peter said, it's not working. He slipped his iPod into his armpit to warm it. I think it's frozen. I gave a half laugh, imagining the iPod on strike protesting working in such cold. Whistle, I suggested, though that seemed a silly thing to do when the world so silent seemed empty. Still, though a whistle wouldn't project as far into the forest, we had to try something. And Peter had a talent for whistling in owls. He had yet to manage to whistle in a sawit, but I had heard him have long hooting conversations with barred and great horned owls. Peter's whistle pierced the pre-dawn air. At first strong, each toot became faint, fainter as the cold took over Peter's lips. That an owl lurked near enough to hear Peter's half-frozen whistle and would grace us with a visit seemed preposterous. Peter paused for a moment, joined me in staring into the darkness and up toward a display of light so sharp and clear I felt lucky to be alive. In that moment, I was willing to believe in anything, Sawed's God or the holiness of CBC. In that moment, I became a convert to this annual tradition. A shooting star traced the arc of the sky, then plummeted as if into the trees. Wish. We both laughed out loud. Do stars grant small wishes? May that owl appear? Or bigger wishes? May we be happy together? I made both, overburdening that one blaze of light. Wait, Peter said, pointing over the water. Hear that? A weak click like snapping fingers emerged from the woods. I noted, I nodded, though I was not familiar with the contact call of the little owl. Peter gave me a thumbs up, saw it. We both jumped with excitement. Then the owl returned Peter's song, its toots evenly cadenced, sweetly resonant. I strained to make out the silhouette of the little bird, a small globe of feathers and killer cuteness perched on the limb of a tree. I wish those stars shine, shine down even brighter to light the flame of the owl's eye for me. 
From the other side of the swamp, a second owl piped up, two. I shifted my gaze back and forth as the owls traded hoots, perhaps discussing these odd two-legged visitors. Friend or foe, they might be wondering. The chorus continued back and forth like hollow chimes in the clear air while we listened, dumbstruck. They really were out there, O ye of little faith. Thank you. <laughs>